Welcome to Three, a show about Federer, Nadal, and Djokovic. I'm Bill Gross, host of Monday Match Analysis with outstanding tennis journalists Joel Drucker and Amy Lundy. And it is time for the French Open. The draw came out earlier today. We are ready for the clay, or, or are we ready for the clay? I, I'm feeling less than 100% ready because normally we have this big, long buildup uh, between, you know, after the Australian Open, tons of time, you know, months go by before the French. And now I feel like I've, I'm in the midst of being hit by a truck because it's already time for another Grand Slam, Joel. Yeah, amazing. I know you're right. Clay court season, long, se- long buildup for long matches. Now it's suddenly, it's, it's late September and it's a different time of year. There are weather implications. There are uh, daylight implications. It's also so soon after the U.S. Open, there are a number of players who did not come to New York to play. And now we've got the players here. So the whole, the whole plot is kind of in its, in an odd way, I think, I think one part of me thinks, about how do we take all this in? And the other part is how great that we just get to see some tennis, that we just get to see some tennis and some wonderful Grand Slam action. Yeah, I'm down with that, totally. But I think that the FFT has got some problems because they've got a handful of positive COVID people. And um, the French government is just saying that they're not sure that they want to let as many fans into the venue as RG had planned. So um, it's bumpy. It's off to a bumpy start. Um, and Nadal um, lost, which is not something he typically does going into Roland Garros. Yeah, that was surprising that he... Um that he lost. I mean, he only won clay court tournaments, but still that he lost earlier than he usually does at those events. So uh, long time since he's played matches. So we'll have to see for that's what we're all curious to see what the, what the tennis fitness for all these guys is. He looked really good before that Schwartzman match. Um, and then he, he really had an off night in a lot of different areas, but we, again, like we get this quick little dress rehearsal and, Amy, it's not that recently he's, he's swept the clay court, you know, titles. And we've seen so many times that Djokovic has beaten him in best of three leading up to the French. But then Paris, Philippe Chatrier, uh, we've seen Nadal get the better of that matchup six of, of seven times um, is, the, is the head-to-head. So I, I don't know. Was that your, what was your big takeaway from, from Rome, Amy? Well, um, first of all, let's not assume that Nadal and Djokovic are going to play each other. Um, As we saw from the U S open, anything could happen, but it's what we all want. (laughs) And it's certainly what we want on this show. Um, So, you know, my big takeaway from Rome is that um, a loss like that to a player like Schwartzman is not going to phase Rafa. Um, He's a guy who, uh, of the big three, probably would take that um, as even keel as as anybody. So um, I think he's feeling his way into his fitness, and and he'll come out with some early round wins, and he'll be fine, and he'll find his way into his game. I think the thing with Nadal is has to do with him feeling he gets enough match play. So, for example, if he lost to Schwartzman. And let's pretend it was some feed in round robin. He would have been glad to just keep playing. And so in a way, it's a little bit like what the pre-Wimbledon time is, where it's this very short window, as Wimbledon is after the, after the French often. And the players are just trying to get innings. They're just trying to get time on the court. And so Nadal, he, did, he you know, obviously he rarely does go, he doesn't go play one clay court tournament. But now with these two weeks, that's, that's what he did. And uh, probably was hoping for some more matches, and he didn't want to play another term this week. He certainly didn't want to go to Hamburg. So I think mm-hmm. his whole thing is, have I put in enough homework? I mean, in the French, is the tournament that traditionally requires the most homework to do. And so, you know, you bring up an interesting point, though, Joel. Let's remember that Nadal is a creature of habit. He likes his bottles the same way. I mean, as strange as this feels to us. It's got to be really strange for him. Absolutely. And it's going to be strange with things like even the term that uh, it's going to it's going to be darker two hours sooner. It might be a little cooler. Not that much. I, I did this story on weather and things. Not that much, but it's still autumn. And we all know no matter where you are in the world, uh, late September, early October 
feels different than late May, early June, even if the temperature is the same. So that's going to be interesting. And then even things like the, the, the sun, the location of the sun. Yep. And you're right. And you think of Rafa, who this is his house. I mean, this is a place he's, what, 93 and 2 lifetime. And so wait, always- wait, what about the balls? The balls are different. It's, a, it's no longer a Babolat ball. It's a Wilson ball. So the, that's going to make a big difference. That'll be a thing to track. That's what, that'll be a, a classic first 72 to 96 hour story about the yeah, ball. Yeah, you love that. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. these stories, they, they become the story. People are talking about, what are you hearing? The court, it's, 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 it, along with its sibling, the, the speed of the court. And of course, the yes. speed of the court will be affected by the weather because there's no, there's no surface that's more affected by weather elements than clay. I mean, you know, you know that you've played on clay probably more than I have. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I would, I would say, you know, the cooler, the, the lower bouncing is the biggest difference. And of course, Nadal and Dominic team with their heavy topspin would love the ball to kick up like a trampoline every time it touches the court. And it's a little bit less likely that they'll get those conditions. With that being said, Nadal has, has battled through all kinds of conditions in Paris and I do think that sometimes it's a little bit overblown, like when it rains and everyone panics about Nadal. I mean, is it, is, is it not like the net net is that if Nadal reaches his, his highest level on clay, that really nobody can beat him? Oh, for sure. I mean, look, highest level, just his level, his level, whatever his level yeah. is. I mean, look at this guy. This guy is probably, you know, whatever those things are the greatest person to dominate one thing, uh, you know, to win, to win this kind of title 12 times. It's amazing. That's an exponential. That's like winning it 144 times. So it was Djokovic who won Rome. So let's, let's hit on him and, and his week. It really reminded me of the week before the U S open, the Western and Southern open Novak continues to not play his best tennis and just still win every match. That, that seems to be the trend right now. I think it's one of those things where his legend and his aura precedes itself. Because as you guys know, tennis is so much about confidence. And what's happening on the women's side with Serena Williams is that people no longer feel that she's invincible. And so people are beating her. Um, and I think with Novak, there's still this air of invincibility. And remember, he didn't lose the U.S. Open because of what happened between, you know, during the points. He lost it because of something that happened between the points. So it's still the number one player in the world. And, you know, you got to beat this guy. And I think from a standpoint of playing style, of our three I think Novak has a kind of, not that the other guys are erratic, but a certain, there's a reliability thing with him. There's a sustainable, you know, I, I, don't, I don't quite have my car analogy yet, but there's something about Novak that's <laughs> so reliable. I mean, Camry? maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe better than a Camry. Well, that's, that's like, true. I, yeah, I didn't, I didn't think that fully through. That's I do think Camrys last the longest of all the cars. But and there's something very stable about Novak. So there's a sense that maybe his, his worst is still pr pretty good. You know what I mean? That he's just so solid. Oh, yeah. And, so good. And, and, and we'd say that for the other guys, but they have to do it. You know, Nadal has to will himself. Like if Nadal's, not, if Nadal's being beaten right, or not playing well, he has to find things, do things, create things, you know, create this kind of stuff. And, and in, a certain, in a different way, kind of that same way for Roger. You know, he's got to add up all these combinations but Novak there's such a, a a practically brilliant you know sustainable quality to his strokes well now that Nadal's physicality has declined I think that that when when he has an off day he, he can't really just loop the ball and run and defend anymore and I think Djokovic kind of still has that ability he can't do it the the whole match but there are times where he can you know, cover the court and, and play safe margins. And if he doesn't have, you know, perfect timing and he's not, he hasn't really calibrated his, his backhand and his forehand, I think without a doubt, he has the highest, lowest level, right? That's right. Exactly right. Couldn't agree with you more. 
I still wish that Rafa had played the U.S. Open um, because, for one thing, he could have won, um, and and that would have given him a lot of confidence going into this. Um, and for another thing, his reasons, one of his reasons, stated reasons, was that he was worried about COVID. And now the French Federation doesn't, at least at the outset, appear to be doing as good a job as the USTA did. To the US Open, I think the big thing for Rafa not, wasn't just the safety, but it was also his own physical safety. And his, the pounding, I think, him taking that much energy and how to play hardcore matches for that long in New York, I think that would have been very counterproductive for his clay court efforts. So I think while a lot of people would have loved to see Nadal in action at, at the US Open, I think for him, it was seriously never on the table that was going to happen. And I think he's glad that he's really been able to focus himself on his beloved slam, as opposed to when he's only won four times. Hmm. I totally agree. I, I think that from a COVID perspective, Amy, I, I think, you know, you obviously have a, a really good logical point there. I just, I just look at it more as of a neat, you know, a, a physical health thing. And I think we'll really get our answer with how well Dominic Team does this, because I think he's fighting an uphill battle uh, with all of the, the physical and emotional beating he took in New York to now play this tournament three weeks later. It wasn't only a physical beating thing. It was also a Novak getting bounced from the tournament thing. But if Rafa had been in the draw, one could argue that the draw would not have been the way it was and Carreno Busto wouldn't have played mm -hmm. Novak. It's like Gossamer's web, if you're familiar with that. But uh, no, and, and we're going to get a lot of comments in the comments section saying, Amy, will you please stop with this? Rafa should have played the U.S. Open. But um, you bring up a great point, Gil. I think what happens with team will be very interesting. And he's in Rafa's side of the draw. So we'll see. Well, we'll see how it goes for team when you, you know, he's got, he's in Rafa's half, but of course, you know, I always look at draw. You try to look and see what's right in front of his first round. He plays Marin Cilic. So that's kind of an interesting uh, matchup. And we'll see, I guess we'll see the physical state of team. I mean, first of all, he is a remarkably fit athlete. So that's, but he hasn't played any, any on clay as, as usual. Like Rafa, he likes a good buildup and likes to play two or three events leading up to it. And, he, and also even earlier in the year, he often plays some South American clay. So, um, that's going to be interesting. But yeah, I, mean, I, I mean, in a way, it's like a, a live living experiment because you have one guy who played a ton of hard court leading into this, and you have another guy who skipped the hard court and played one clay court tournament going into it and lost. So the intrigue. Yeah, it's very, it's very intriguing. And, and we'll see, and of course, and then, and then team, and he won it. And he won the big U.S. Open. So that makes him feel... Hey, that's pretty good. Now I come to this one. I've gotten to the finals two years in a row. I got my teams. The one's gotten to both slam finals this year. Yes. You know, right in here. So, yep. so he's, he's saying, what do you guys talk about this three? What do you guys are program for three? What about yeah. me? <laughs> <laughs> well, right now it is three with, with him, with, with, with Federer out. It, there's a huge, well, there's a huge drop off after, I mean, I, I really can't at all see, not Nadal, Djokovic, or team winning. And I actually think it's really hard to even decide who that fourth favorite is. Yeah, it's not Medvedev. No, um, it's not Medvedev on clay. I, I saw some noise on Twitter today. Um, Medvedev's not as bad on clay as you think, and it threw out some results, Monte Carlo, this, that, yeah. and the other. But remember, Medvedev is known to not be a best of five guy. So um, best of five on clay is tough, man. It's tough. But he, well, is, he is the number four seed. So 0-3 at Roland Garros. But he also, the last time he played it was 19. And that was before what I would call the, the, the breakout period. You know, I think every player oh, has sure. kind of the, the B, C, and A, D of their career. And so Medvedev, while he had some results prior to that Roland Garros 2019, it wasn't really until the summer of 19 that he really, he really stepped into the elite. So 
we'll see. But I don't know, fourth favorite. I, I don't. It, it's okay. There isn't. There there needn't have to be. You know, it's like a. Four, it's it's okay. You know, there isn't a lot of that. That gets beyond handicapping. But again, if you said to someone, yes, uh, Nadal, Djokovic, uh, team, and you can have the other hundred hundred twenty five. Right. Take the three. Take the three. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> yeah, I mean, we well, we were talking off air that um, racket speed has become so important on clay because the ball just kind of loses the pace on the bounce, so you have to generate your own. And we've seen kind of Nadal and team, and I'd say uh, Vavrinka be almost the the posters of racket speed, at least on on both sides, because you have the two one handers there. Uh, Medvedev is is really on the other spectrum. He really doesn't swing that fast. That's right. He's, he's lyrical. Forward. He's, yes. yeah. He's, but he's got those long levers. I mean, I think it's about, a lot of it is about strength, especially yeah. on the men's side, because think about it. You're hitting a ball that is topping toward you. You then want to stop it from coming this way and send it back the other way. That takes a lot of strength and it wears on you over a long rally. Well, that's for the Dow and team. I and mean, it's kind of like the, you know, the RPM boys. I mean, the guys who can really, I mean, it's such, this really starts 20, 25 years ago. With and Quirton. Jack Sock. Well, yeah, yeah, and Jack Sock. But, but, but Querton is the first guy to use the Lexalon and to really bring in the concept. Oh, oh Querton. Gustavo Querton and then and when he wins it in 97 and now we're, we're playing on clay we're not it's not just your grandfather's uh, Roland Garros were a lot where it's one more on attrition you know it was like the a little bit the Borg era and Michael Chang and others were just it was more of the grind but now I mean in a way this is what kept a great deal of the other Spaniards not quite there like you know like like you're like David Ferrer Ferrer wasn't quite able to accelerate as dynamically as someone as Nadal. I mean, Nadal is just well, it's incredible. mass plus acceleration equals exactly. power. I exactly. think the acceleration was there, just not enough mass. Well, that's the problem. You know, it's funny. I'll tell you a funny thing. Um, Martina Navratilova told me once we were talking about the top players and skills, and and she said, you know, at the lower levels, outside of the top two hundred or three hundred, it's about skill. It's about who has the proper ability to use their body and techniques and tactics and mental toughness but the higher levels you can't teach height so you take the people like Ferrer or Goffin or um Simone well Simone is a little technically limited but uh the Rokic is Schwartzman. Schwartzman yeah Schwartzman's a great example Schwartzman's a great example he's fantastic but you can't teach height and he can't bring as much like Amy talked about the livers and uh leverage so we'll see better than serve yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and service is very important on clay. Um, don't ever let anyone tell you it's not. Um, especially um, with the Paris conditions, you know, depending on what they are, you know, if it's heavy and humid, um, who knows if it's dry, if it's cooler, um, serve depending on those conditions can be more of a factor. That's true, but I, I think it's, it's less of a factor. Right, it is diminished oh, because yeah. because it's just easier to get the ball back and play. Then the other slams, down. yeah, uh, that that there's more time. Yeah, you know, I I don't know I don't know if the statistics bear that out because I have looked at that before. Um, hmm, light bulb, maybe that's a good idea. Um, <laughs> it's if, if, if if serve is mitigated on clay, it's not as much as you would think. It's still very important to have a okay. great. No, that's true. But I still think we all think it's that the way serve can be leveraged. Like I wrote this a, over a year ago. I said the serve volley game will come back when Raleigh Opelka wins Roland Garros with kick serves and angle volleys against these returners who stand eight, ten feet behind the baseline to return. But that's that's got to be in someone's laboratory somewhere who's 13 years old i'm not but but serve the deployment of serve yeah you you can't you can't hit as many whopper serves on clay if you have a little more time to return so the return i think i think the return and the return becomes really important and the contemporary game has been a lot more decided by the returners in the last 10 or 15 years than the servers Right, do you and guys, do you, sorry, Gil, I got to just okay. throw this out because this is bothering me. I'm seeing a lot of noise about this on Twitter. 
do you guys really think that these players should be using the underhand serve um, against an Nadal or a team? Absolutely. You see that? You see that? But is it – you tell me, if you don't practice that, is it something that's easy to do if you're a pro? No. 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 It's not, it's not, okay. It's not, I didn't think so because I don't know. I mean I, – <laughs> I don't know if I could do it. Oh it's, no, but be kind of, well, no, I saw I saw Karlovich hit when the I saw Karlovich hit when the other day in the qualifying against yeah. Noah Rubin, but it looked like a feed from a pro. It had no it had no skill to it. And so Rubin just kind of whacked it. But if if you practice it, and there's no reason it, it, it's actually an easy shot to practice. It's a the serve is one of the best shots of all to practice. It's completely in your control. Bring out your basket and go to work. And so you spend what, I, I, you think if you spent uh, 15 minutes three times a week, hitting 20 or 30 of them? You'd, I don't know, you'd... With, with pressure? No, no. Uh, so, so okay, I've seen, good. first of all, like I've, I've seen Monfils practice it um, okay. before the Curios era. So that's the first time I saw it. But anyway, um, here's the thing. You can't disguise it well. It's just not really possible. Right, it's not like you're throwing, right? Your court position can't be very good. It's you have to hit it on the baseline, which is right. it's kind of far back to hit a drop shot. And you'll never have your opponent off balance because they're in a return position, you know, basically ready to pounce. So I just don't think it's a shot that is going to be very effective unless you act uh, at a high percentage, I'll say. Well, a hyper, but I think, but as, as a, as, you know, but it's, it's like the quarterback draw or a certain kind of plays. It's like, yeah, maybe, maybe I might. And to have you know, see, and the whole point of tactic, a whole point of tactics, isn't for that point. It's investment in the whole match. I got that. And the match is eight hundred pages long, so I think players should be practicing it, and I think they should practice it. And I'm not saying they should use it. I, I, they could use it ten times. I don't care. If they use it three times a match. Just the point of trying it might spark something and might create a certain kind of doubt. And and as far as look. People on Twitter saying they shouldn't. We, why? Or they think it's what would tell no, me. No, they what? should. A lot of people on Twitter saying they should. Like it's easy. Um, I mean, what if you well, net the thing? It's embarrassing. Well, it's then you net it, but it's like uh, it. It should be. I think a smart teacher. I like. I always say, not the game of today, the game of tomorrow, and the game we, the game one should seek to learn is the antidote to the prevailing game. The prevailing game. We're seeing, we talked about, we're seeing um, deeper return positions, ground strokes, desire to return the ball, deep middle. So why not until proven guilty? And so why not learn sure. that, add that to your arsenal to know how to do that? Once upon a time, everybody hit sliced backhands and someone came along, hmm, I might be able to create some more damage here if I could drive my backhand and two hands. It's, it's a totally, A, it's a totally legitimate shot and B, it's worth a go just for the threat that I may. Yeah. If- yeah. I think you okay. convinced me sure. here. To- totally fair. But I-, I do have one more point to make in-, in the corner of how difficult it would be to execute. How many times do you play and your opponent hits a shot that they don't mean to be a drop shot and it bounces twice before you? It oh, happens yeah. to me. It happened to me four times this morning. Well, I can't speak okay. to your guys in your core position. I can't speak to you guys in your core position. I mean, Joel's you know, going to the like net. Returning in Bermuda, you're like <laughs> sitting in Bermuda. So that doesn't happen to you because you're you just go to the net right away. So and I'm already. I'm well. It, it's of course it happens. So anyway, but okay, continue. Does it happen? Point. Okay, notice it doesn't happen to pros. They don't. The ball doesn't yeah, bounce no. twice in yeah. front of them. They're, they're too fast. Uh, rarely, rarely. I think you're looking at. I think you're not. I think you're not looking at it as a strategy or tactic. You're looking at it as the point win or loss. You're looking at it in the moment of what can happen in a point. And so, and that's not the point always of a tactic. The point of a tactic isn't to win. Isn't necessarily to win this point. The point of a tactic is to plant seeds for the whole part of the game. It's the same reason why in a football game on second and one, I might throw. Sure, I can get the first down. I'm going to throw long. I want you to know that I might go to that guy. And that, now I got you just – I need to establish the whole game. And so 
So I, I do know now something, Gil, if and when we ever play, I definitely know what I'm going to be doing if, at least <laughs> once. Well, I, I will say that if someone had practiced it and they had it down cold, um, it would be a great tactic to try against Rafa because I think that would really ruffle his feathers and, and get him off his rhythm. Curious well, to and Acapulco, the right? Well, right. Yeah. The, the, thing, the, the, pro, the problem with the Curious thing is the Curious emotional layer that is also at conflict with Rafa because Nadal does not like playing people he doesn't like. This was a problem with Soderling too. If you're, if you're, if you're, if Federer did it, I think there's the feather, there's getting his feathers ruffled in tennis. And then there's the emotional part and see, you know, that's kind of the twin aspect of, of tactics. And I think the Kyrgios thing is both because Kyrgios is approaches competition differently than Nadal does. Yeah. And that's something Nadal doesn't care for. And in Nadal's mind, I think a guy like Kyrgios, you're not, you're not respecting me, the people who pay to see you play, the game itself. What do you think you're doing? And there's the, so the underhand serve gets inadvertently conflated with that. I don't think, I mean, Nadal knows it's a legitimate tactic. He doesn't mind that. Yeah, I, I think you're probably correct. It's the big picture when he played Nick in Acapulco and was clearly uh, very resentful of his opponent. Um, I, yeah, I think it's, it's the full picture. Um, if, Andy hit it, if Andy Murray hit it, did that, I don't think Nadal would bat an eye. Yeah, I think that I, it's very possible. Um, so let's, let's wrap it up. Um, and I think at some point we got to get into the Nadal Djokovic matchup and how it shifts on clay because it is uh, 29 26. Uh, that's the overall head to head. But then when you shift it to clay, it's 17 7 Nadal. So we, we love asking the question why on this show. And hopefully we get to do that. Um, I'm sure we'll get to do that even next week or the week after French Open starts. We hope everyone enjoys. And uh, we appreciate everyone who is subscribing on YouTube, liking the video, leaving a comment, and rating and reviewing on Apple. So enjoy the French Open, everyone, the first week, that is. Uh, We will talk to you very soon on the next episode 